Our second reading takes us to another prophet, the prophet Isaiah. And in our story today, we meet the prophet as he is on his way, or actually I should say as he has arrived, and is confronting King Ahaz of Judah. King Ahaz was out looking at one of the conduits that would bring water into the city when Isaiah approached him. And as we'll see, Ahaz was pretty freaked out because of some, let's just say, pressure from surrounding nations that was leading to a lot of stress for Ahaz and his people. And so Ahaz is out there looking at the water, looking within himself, looking around himself for answers as he's looking for something that he can do to resolve the tension that he's currently dealing with. And so we're going to go to Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 17. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. The king of Assyria. This is God's word to us this morning. Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, again, we thank you for bringing us to this place, for drawing us together and welcoming us to worship. God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are pleasing to you, our God our rock, and our redeemer. <clears throat> so one of my favorite parts of Christmas is seeing all the decorations. And coming in this morning, seeing all the nativity scenes set up was just amazing. As I shared with the first service, I never knew so many different types of nativity scenes existed in the world. Um, it's just very, very cool. And it reminded me of how every year when my family decorates for Christmas. The decoration that I look forward to the most that we have is our nativity scene. You see, we have this wonderful old nativity scene that belonged to my, originally belonged to my grandmother. And I think the story goes that she actually made this nativity in some way, whether it was painting the figures or finding the hay or whatever it, whatever it was, she put it together. And after my grandparents died, I asked my dad if I could have this nativity set. And it's a big nativity set with a whole lot of characters. And as a child, I remember going to my grandparents' house on Christmas Eve and seeing this nativity set up and just kind of being in awe of the whole thing and wondering about these characters, these cast members who were all here to see the birth of Jesus. I remember also playing with all those figures too, which my grandma was probably not too crazy about, but... Regardless, I remember that there was this one figure, this one character who, to this day, I have no idea who he is. Um, but I always thought he sort of looked like Superman because he had this blue cape and these red pants. Um, that was before I realized Superman was not at the birth of Christ. Okay? The rest of the cast, though, is pretty much what you would expect. There's Mary and Joseph, the baby Jesus, the angels, the wise men, the shepherds, and all the animals. And when you start to consider the cast of characters that are usually part of a nativity scene, it really is a fascinating mix of outcasts and outsiders. And yet every single one of them gathered to witness the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, had been born. And so this Advent, we're going to take a closer look at the cast of characters with our series, The Cast of Christmas. We're going to take a closer look at the angels the shepherds, the wise men. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to take a closer look at our role in Jesus' birth. 
Because we too are a cast member in the Christmas story. Today, though, to get us started, we're going to look at cast members who aren't usually included in a nativity scene. The prophets. Without the prophets, we never would have known who Jesus was and why his birth would change the world. The prophets are the ones who prepared the world and us by dropping hint after hint long, long ago about who Jesus was and that this person was coming. We can go all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, in which God designates four roles that will lead Israel as they start new lives free from Pharaoh and Canaan. Judge, king, priest, and prophet. Now each of these offices represented a different value essential to building and sustaining a covenant community like justice, learning, and trust. The prophets, however, represented the fundamental value of truth. And that's because they served as the legitimate voice of God. There was no delineation between the voice of the prophet and the voice of God. In fact, prophets were a sign, especially in times of stress, that God was present and active in the world. Now, in our second scripture reading, God has sent the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz because Judah was in the midst of a very stressful period. They were surrounded by threats. The lesser threat was two kingdoms to the north, Israel and Syria, who were trying to form this coalition of nations, including some that were south of Israel, to stand against who was the greater threat at this time, the empire of the day, Assyria. And so Judah was caught in the middle of these nations as they were all posturing and preparing for war. And Ahaz felt the threat so deeply that Isaiah says the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest before the wind. And now in the midst of Ahaz and the people's fear comes the prophet Isaiah to confront the king. Isaiah tells Ahaz that the invasion he fears won't happen. That everything is going to be okay if he just trusts. God. So Ahaz at this point really has a choice. He can give in to his fear or he can give in to faith. He can seek protection from the threat in the north from Assyria or trust God to, to uh, prevail over all the threats. Now in the end Ahaz chose Assyria over God. Which I suppose shouldn't surprise us because choosing to align ourselves with power feels safe. Whereas faith is far more risky. Faith demands we wait when the rest of the world is gearing up for action. Faith demands discernment through prayer and the study of God's word when the rest of the world is reacting imprudently. Faith demands humility and even repentance when the rest of the world is showing strength and pride more than anything. Faith demands letting go of our fear and trusting God. As Isaiah himself said, if you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. So Isaiah's message really is faith matters. Because faith matters, God does offer unmistakable signs to encourage faith, to encourage our faith. Like God offered Ahaz the sign of the prophet Isaiah himself. God also offered Ahaz the sign of Emmanuel, God with us. Both of these signs show concern and are the good news coming into our world full of problems. And yet Ahaz rejects both signs. The irony is that Emmanuel is the righteous one who will bring justice to the world. That means Emmanuel is the sign that Ahaz could have relied on to wait out the impending war faithfully. It also means Emmanuel is the sign that we can rely on to wait out all the suffering and violence of our world as well. You see, waiting for God is a necessary part of faith. The prophets knew this. They knew that waiting 
prepares us to be the people God intended us to be. That waiting teaches us humility, discipline, and the value of the one we wait for. Waiting requires us to let go of control and give our future into God's hands. You may have heard the phrase, don't just stand there, do something. You may have even said it. Waiting, though, says, don't just do something. Stand there. You see, the consequence of waiting is a deep, resolving faith. As the prophet Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, every year during Advent, the voices of the prophets confront us with the same choice that Ahaz had. We stand firm in faith or we stand not at all. Now, Ahaz didn't stand firm in faith. And while the kingdom of Judah and Ahaz's throne stood for a while, eventually the kingdom of Judah eventually fell and went into exile. Just as God threw Isaiah's sinner. Now it wasn't long after that that the time of the prophets came to an end. It came to an end shortly after Israel came back from the exile. But prophets like Malachi, who, are often, who is often considered to be the final prophet, we're still dropping hints about the coming of Christ. Which shows us that God's sign of Emmanuel stands no matter what. And that's why the role of the prophet lives on in the life of the church today as well. Frederick Beekner, the Presbyterian pastor, said, A prophet's quarrel with the world is deep down a lover's quarrel. If they didn't love the world, they probably wouldn't bother to tell it that it's going to hell. They just let it go. Their quarrel, our quarrel, is God's quarrel. In other words, prophets, prophecy, whether it was Isaiah or the church today, we serve as a light in the darkness. We serve as the sign of God's love and activity and presence in our world. That's why prophecy fills us with the expected hope that we need to stand firm in faith. That's why we serve the same prophetic voice to our world as Isaiah was to his world. We know that culture has changed drastically since Ahaz ruled Judah. But as God's people, we are still surrounded by constant threats. There are still so many people whose hearts are shaking as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Folks, that tells us that faith still matters. And our purpose as a church is to be a lamp in this dark world. We as the church are the sign of Emmanuel, God with us. Because God is with us today. So maybe you know and may those around us know it as well. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Loving and gracious God, we thank you for prophets. We thank you for sending them, whether it be Isaiah or us as the church, as a light into our world. A light that reminds us that you are still here that our faith is not misplaced and that we need to continue to stand firm. God, we pray for the patience to wait, for the courage to wait. God, we pray that we can put all of our trust in you, that we can hear the prophetic voices and know that your signs are there. Follow them. God, again, we thank you for prophets, especially your prophet Isaiah and others who spoke of the coming of your son, Emmanuel. And God, we pray that we can be your son in our world today. We thank you, God, and we offer this prayer to you in your name. Amen.